Anesthesia Rounds, a series of discussions of clinical problems facing the anesthesiologist. Anesthesia Rounds is presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by Aerst Laboratories. Dr. Alan B. Dobkin is professor and chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology of the State University of New York Upstate Medical Center and director of anesthesiology, State University Hospital in Syracuse, New York. In this interview, Dr. Dobkin defines the terms and concepts associated with pre-anesthetic management. He discusses such related questions as the selection of anticholinergic drugs, the use of sedative drugs in combination, the use of non-sedative premedicant drugs, and the use of preoperative drugs in specific disease situations. Dr. Dobkin, how does the term preoperative medication differ from premedication? The two terms are synonymous. Preoperative medication, the original term, came into the literature after 1910 and referred to the use of morphine and atropine before chloroform and to atropine before ether. The phrase was shortened to premedication by McMechan in 1920. Is this medication part of the anesthesia itself, or is it part of anesthetic management in general? Premedication may be considered a part of the anesthetic when you employ drugs that have potent hypnotic, analgesic, or muscle relaxant properties, and actions that block adverse responses or augment some desirable properties of the anesthetic drugs. For example, when they promote hypotension or hypothermia for special needs, or reduce the chance of toxic reaction to local anesthetics, or allergic reaction to dye injections in diagnostic tests. On the other hand, the main purpose for premedican drugs is to cause psychic sedation, reduce anxiety, and secure a basal physiologic state resistant to the hazards of mental stress factors not associated with the specific anesthetic. The end result desired is a smooth induction of anesthesia. Does premedication permit a decreased concentration of anesthetic agent in clinical doses? In most instances, premedication does not appreciably affect the concentration of the anesthetic agent. This is true, for example, of moderate amounts of analgesic and hypnotic drugs, with or without antisilagogues. On the other hand, if one employs potent psychosedatives or powerful hypnotics, which may reduce total oxygen consumption rate and add narcotic analgesics, the amount of general anesthesia needed is reduced appreciably so that weak anesthetics can be used in place of the potent agents or the potent agents can be used in low concentrations. In general terms, doctor, what is the purpose of this medication? How often is the purpose fulfilled? The prime purpose of premedication is to permit smooth induction of anesthesia. To accomplish this, it is usually necessary to reduce gastrointestinal and airway secretions, induce amnesia and drowsiness, promote equanimity or tranquility in the face of noxious mental stimuli, and sensory deprivation sufficient to ensure that the patient will not experience any painful stimuli up to the time that a surgical plane of anesthesia is reached. These goals can be attained in 80 to 90 percent of patients if the anesthesiologist sees the patient the day before surgery to establish rapport, carefully assesses physical and psychic state, and then at surgery avoids any procedures that may cause pain or fear and chooses wisely those drugs and dosages which are appropriate to the patient, his diseases, and the contemplated procedures. While a few clinicians can create optimum conditions without premedican drugs, most find them necessary. Mismanagement in the hospital environment can annul established rapport or accentuate the undesirable side effects of drugs. Therefore, many factors influence the success of premedication. Uh, Dr. Dobkin, why not return to the days of basal narcosis? Induction of basal narcosis with rectal or intramuscular medication 
has been discarded as a pre-medicine technique except for extremely agitated patients, for children aged two to five years who are difficult to manage, and for the occasional patient with uncontrollable severe hyperthyroidism. There are three main reasons for avoiding this technique. Because respiration and circulation are often severely depressed, the patient must be under skilled surveillance from the time the state is induced until the anesthesiologist takes over fully. The drugs used for inducing basal narcosis have toxic effects that are difficult to control. And finally, recovery of consciousness and return of stable vital signs are appreciably delayed following anesthesia. What is the purpose of the belladonna drugs? How do you choose among atropine, scopolamine, and others? Belladonna drugs are used primarily for their anticholinergic effects, that is, to diminish stimulation of secretions that frequently accompany induction of inhalation anesthesia, and to prevent excessive vagal activity during high spinal anesthesia or anesthesia with the many inhalation agents that have a strong cholinergic effect on the heart. Use of these drugs in premedication also prevents undesirable laryngeal, bronchial, and myocardial reflexes during endotracheal intubation. Bradycardia, hypotension, and cardiac arrhythmias due to visceral traction may also be reduced or eliminated. These drugs should be used with caution in patients with pre-existing tachycardia and those with fever because sweating is depressed. How is the choice of specific agent made? The choice between D-L-hyosiamine, L-hyosine, and other anticholinergic drugs depends on these considerations. L-hyosine provides moderate sedation and amnesia and potent anti-silagogue activity, but is a weak vagolytic agent. On the other hand, D-L-hyosiamine is a mild cortical stimulant, a potent vagolytic agent against visceral reflexes, and has about half the anti-silagogue potency of L-hyosine. Their duration of action is approximately equal. L-hyosiamine has the same anti-silagogue activity as L-hyosine. Parenteral oxyphenonium, hexocyclium, and methanthelene have anti-silagogue and vagolytic effects similar to atropine, but do not appear to have appreciable cortical effects. It is worth noting that many of the newer sedatives have some anti-silagogue effect. Is a sedative primarily a hypnotic or a tranquilizer? Although all physicians use the term sedative, few have a clear explanation of what it really means. Probably the correct definition of sedative is a drug that imparts a state of imperturbability or equanimity in the patient. The drugs chosen are usually those that suppress mental stress or anxiety caused by physical debility and disease states. Wesley Bourne felt that to sedate a patient being prepared for operation, one must obtund, obfuscate, and obnubilate. That is, dull or dead in pain producing analgesia, obscure cloud or darkened memory producing amnesia, and cloud consciousness or cause mental haziness producing sleepiness. For many years, alcohol, barbiturates, bromides, peraldehyde, and narcotic analgesics were reused to produce this state. Recently, drugs have been developed that produce tranquility or ataraxia terms that can be equated to equanimity, but often without the sleepiness caused by the older agents. What is a narcotic? Are all analgesics narcotics? A narcotic is a drug, such as morphine, that relieves pain, 
induces drowsiness and in some subjects induces an exaggerated feeling of well-being or euphoria that may lead to a feeling of dependence. Not all analgesics are classed as narcotics. Only those analgesics of high potency that are likely to cause euphoria and lead to dependence and tolerance are called narcotics. When is an analgesic indicated for a premedication, doctor? Narcotic analgesics are indicated in premedication when the patient has physical pain that cannot be relieved by mild analgesics such as aspirin. Some clinicians feel that this is the only indication for their use. Others feel that even when the patient does not have pain beforehand, a modest amount is useful to prevent pain and agitation that might occur during preparation for induction of anesthesia, especially in those patients who complain bitterly when their veins must be cannulated. What precautions should be used with narcotics? Asthmatic patients sometimes do not tolerate narcotic analgesics well and are best sedated with potent tranquilizers having bronchodilator properties. Because respiratory depression occurs, breathing should be carefully monitored in elderly patients receiving morphine or any other narcotic analgesics, particularly when the intramuscular or intravenous route is used and high blood levels are reached quickly. Risk of overdosage also exists when the subcutaneous route is used in patients in shock. Such patients have cutaneous vasoconstriction and absorption is therefore delayed. Giving additional doses in an attempt to produce a clinical effect can lead to overdosage when the shock has been corrected and the total dose of morphine is absorbed suddenly. Therefore, only slow intravenous administration may be used safely for the patient in shock. Any patient with a reduced respiratory reserve should be given narcotics with great caution, especially when oxygen is administered. The possibility of aggravating hypoventilation and bronchospasm must always be considered. Since narcotics cross the placental barrier freely, administration during the latter phases of labor depresses respiration in the newborn. Antagonists should always be available and given if a narcotic was administered within four hours of the baby's delivery. Action on the peripheral blood vessels is apt to cause orthostatic hypotension. This effect is increased in patients having either a reduced blood volume or a vascular bed of reduced tonus caused by other medications, for example, the phenothiazines. What are other notable contraindications, Dr. Dobkin? Narcotics should not be given to patients with head injuries or raised intracranial pressure, since respiratory depression will be enhanced and a rise in tension of arterial carbon dioxide will further increase intracranial pressure. In any case, the level of consciousness, pupil size, and the presence of vomiting are important diagnostic signs in such situations, and the use of narcotics will tend to confuse the clinical picture. Narcotics show dangerous interactions with certain other drugs, notably monoamine oxidase inhibitors. For example, with isocarbazid, phenalazine, and tranylcypromine, normal doses of narcotics can cause severe hypotension and deep depression leading to coma. Excitement hypertension, hyperpyrexia, and convulsions have also occurred. 
It must be remembered that monoamine oxidase inhibitors can continue to exert an effect for up to 21 days after their use has been discontinued. Thus, it is imperative to determine what other drugs a patient has been taking before administering a narcotic analgesic. And of course, narcotics are capable of inducing addiction. How should the anesthesiologist react to a patient who is euphoric before operation? The euphoric patient is talkative and voices an exaggerated feeling of well-being in the face of a situation which is usually frightening. Before surgery, the wise clinician regards this as a sign of an expressed denial by the patient of a threat to his life and an indication of inadequate sedation or an undesirable response to a narcotic drug. It should signal the prompt administration of anesthesia which will render the patient unconscious smoothly and quickly. What about sedative drug combinations? On what basis are doses in combination used? The commonest combinations of drugs used consist of an anticholinergic such as atropine, a narcotic analgesic such as morphine, and a hypnotic such as secobarbital. When the narcotic analgesic or hypnotic barbiturate is contraindicated, one of the phenothiazines or butyrophenone derivatives may be substituted. Several antihistaminics such as promethazine or diphenhydramine combined with scopolamine are useful when iodinated dye injection or inhalation is required for diagnostic x-ray procedures. When skeletal muscle spasm or pain is present, chlordiazep oxide, diazepam, or methocarbamyl with scopolamine are also useful. There is no well-defined basis for doses of combinations, although when a full therapeutic dose of morphine is used, the dose of atropine has been established by experience to be approximately 5% of it. This reduces the emetic and cholinergic actions of morphine. If a barbiturate is given at the same time, its dose is reduced whereas if it is given 30 to 60 minutes earlier, a somewhat larger dose may be employed and the narcotic dose reduced. Whenever these combinations are used, the wise clinician will determine the doses according to the age, size, and physical and mental condition of the patient and will be very circumspect before adding rather than substituting a tranquilizer, lest severe cardiovascular depression occurs. Dr. Dobkin, why is there so much individual variation in the response of the patient to anti-stress premedication? The hospital environment itself is often the most disturbing factor affecting the psychic response of the patient. Even the most placid patient may lose his composure if embarrassed during physical examination, hurt and starved during diagnostic tests, treated roughly and without obvious compassion, and finally brought to an operating theater with its bright lights and noises without premedication. There is great individual variation in the psychic response to the need for a surgical operation for several reasons. These may be related to the total life experience of the patient and to the neurochemical patterns of responsive behavior that have developed in him. Variations may occur in the hospital environment depending upon the relationship that has been established with the surgeon and others that take care of the patient, and finally, on whether rapport has been developed with the anesthesiologist. During growth and development, each individual consciously and unconsciously 
learns to employ defensive mechanisms that balance or annul the unpleasant emotion of anxiety. These sometimes lead eventually to a variety of symptoms such as phobias, somatic conversions, and dissociative reactions. What is the specific physiology of these variations? Depending on the areas of the brain cortex, limbic system, hypothalamus, and thalamus that are stimulated by anxiety, behavior may differ in each individual. The determining factors usually depend on whether discharges occur through certain cortical or subcortical structures of the brain. If abnormal discharges pass mainly through the sympathetic parts to cause release of catecholamines, the patient's physical response to intense anxiety is evidenced in varying degree by elevated blood pressure, tachycardia, palpitation, sweating, pallor, urinary frequency, vertigo, headache, chest pain, anorexia, nausea, abdominal cramps, tremors, weakness, sleeplessness, or even syncope. If the abnormal discharges pass through the parasympathetic parts, releasing acetylcholine, a different kind of perturbation becomes evident, as seen in the tense patient with peptic ulcer or spastic colon. What of other systemic effects? Other kinds of psychic disturbance have been related to anxiety-induced alterations in the ratio of intracellular to extracellular serotonin. A rise in intracellular serotonin in response to apprehension affects nerve conduction and cardiovascular homeostasis and leads to increased skeletal muscle tone excessive alertness, neuromuscular and psychic irritability, and convulsive behavior. The reverse causes psychic depression, withdrawal, and catatonia. It is also well known that psychic stress may cause release of histamine, resulting in respiratory wheezing patchy redness of the skin with itching and headache. In recent years, the central neurophysiological processes underlying anxiety have been attributed also to effects on the midbrain reticular formation and the diffuse thalamocortical projections of the reticular activating system. Stimulation of this system normally appears as alertness or wakefulness, but also may provide what is termed an emotional cloak for incoming hurtful sensory stimuli and impressions. The diversity of the individual emotional response to stress and anxiety, as well as to drugs which affect the psyche, has been attributed to variation in the sensitivity of this system and its connections with sensory and motor pathways. The limbic system has also been implicated as having predominant effects on the response to emotional stress, the pathway being known as the Papez circuit. The latter may be overridden by feedback impulses from the thalamus. Dr. Dobkin, can these variations in psychic response be controlled? The anesthesiologist cannot control variation in the patient's response to stress by a personal interview alone because the patient is usually reticent or unable to express his fears or may effectively disguise them. Nor does the anesthesiologist have the time or skill to expose them for proper evaluation. Fortunately, the many new drugs that have now been developed 
along with the narcotic analgesics, can decrease mental agitation by inhibiting in the subcortical reticular activating system the transmission of disturbing motor, sensory, and psychic stimuli to the cortex. These drugs, which we call tranquilizers or ataractics, also effectively raise the threshold of response to reflex stimulation in specific areas of the cortex, limbic system, thalamus, hypothalamus, spinal cord, and certain highly sensitive reflex areas in other parts of the body. They may also provide the physical and mental relaxation needed for the development of natural sleep. How is the dose of pre-anesthetic agents judged? Several factors are involved in determining the effective dose of pre-medicant drugs for a particular patient. For practical reasons, the apparent level of metabolic activity is the most important single factor since the effectiveness of sedative drugs is usually inversely related to this vital parameter. The anesthesiologist has some reliable guidelines for determining metabolic activity. The age, weight, and sex of the patient are most useful. In general, the dose of the sedative drugs may be determined first by the age and weight of the patient considering the coded average therapeutic dose as that for a 70 kilogram healthy male adult. For children aged 2 to 15 years, the dose by weight may be increased by 20 to 30 percent because of their higher level of metabolism. From 16 to 60 years, there is only a slight difference, which may be ignored. Above age 60, the dose of sedative drugs should be substantially reduced at each decade. Half at age 70, a quarter at age 80, and none above 85 years. Female patients usually do well with a reduction in dose of approximately 25% and should receive no sedative drug above age 75 years. Infants up to age one and a half years can also have sedative drugs deleted from their preparation. What else is considered with respect to weight, Dr. Dobkin? The weight factor should be evaluated in relation to the normal average weight according to height and age for the patient. If the subject is emaciated, the dose should be substantially reduced. The grossly obese or edematous patient should also have a lower dose, one that is related to lean body mass rather than actual weight. What other factors must be borne in mind? The previous consideration should always be modified by the following factors. The strong, active patient requires and tolerates a significantly larger amount of sedation, while a debilitated, weak patient tolerates very much less or should not receive any strong sedative. If the body temperature is elevated, approximately 10% more sedative should be given for each degree centigrade above 38 while the hypothermic patient whose temperature is below 36 degrees centigrade should not receive any. The general disposition of the patient should also be taken into account. The agitated patient with obvious pain or other discomfort requires and tolerates much more than the average dose, whereas a placid lethargic subject without evidence of appreciable overt discomfort, needs much less. What is the rationale for this method of determining dose? Experience has shown that in strong, active subjects, 
and those with marked hyperthyroidism, a normal dose of sedation has little or no obvious effect, while the seriously ill with cachexia, weakness, and general debility become comatose even with a small dose of a sedative. The selection of dose, therefore, is really a combination of pharmacological, physiological, and empirical considerations. When is pre-medication administered? A drug should be administered the evening before surgery to ensure a restful sleep. If the patient is not obviously agitated, does not have a life-threatening condition, and usually sleeps well, a moderate dose of a barbiturate or non-barbiturate hypnotic, or the full therapeutic dose of a tranquilizer, such as diazepam, is usually satisfactory. On the other hand, if the patient is quite agitated, a psychosedative with strong hypnotic properties is indicated. On the day of surgery, it is important to time the premedicant drugs so that the therapeutic action has developed fully before the patient leaves his hospital room. Hypnotic sedatives given orally or intramuscularly require at least 90 minutes to reach peak effect, while narcotic analgesics, the potent tranquilizers and antipsychotic drugs should be given intramuscularly 60 minutes before the time planned for induction of anesthesia. When is medication given intravenously, doctor? If, for any reason, premedication has not been given in the hospital room at the appropriate time, it is usually best to wait for the arrival in the operating room and administer the drug in reduced dosage intravenously. This is also the appropriate procedure for acute emergency situations, especially if the patient is in traumatic or hemorrhagic shock. Whenever medications are given intravenously, they should be diluted five to ten times and given slowly so that their effect can be gauged during injection. Are different medications given before short operations and long ones? The duration of the operation has some influence on the choice of premedication. Long-acting tranquilizers or analgesics that might prolong anesthesia and sleep should not be used prior to a short operation unless clearly indicated. Is the same medication given before traumatic and non-traumatic operations, painful and non-painful operations? Generally, yes. The main consideration is whether the patient has pain before surgery. If so, the patient should certainly receive an effective dose of an analgesic drug. The matter of trauma and pain during surgery influence the selection of the anesthetic agents rather than the premedicants. Should other drugs used in preparation of the patient be considered as premedicants? Yes, of course. Digitalis should be administered as necessary if the patient is already receiving it to control atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, or heart failure. In the case of patients with poor myocardial function, the routine use of digitalis should not be made without prior consultation with the physician who was previously attending the patient. Since digitalis has a positive inotropic effect on the heart, even in the absence of heart failure, full digitalization is frequently recommended prophylactically before major operations if there are clear signs of organic heart disease on ECG, X-ray, and clinical examination. Premedicant drugs should not be administered specifically for their cardiac antiarrhythmic properties as therapy or prophylaxis unless there are clear-cut indications.
Even then, it is wise to manage the anesthetic so that arrhythmias are unlikely to occur. If they develop, appropriate measures to eliminate them should then be taken. Such measures include hyperventilation with oxygen, reduction of anesthetic concentration, administration of atropine for supraventricular arrhythmias, and if ventricular arrhythmias do not disappear with the above measures, a beta adrenergic blocker may be given cautiously. Dr. Dobkin, what about diuretics and corticosteroids? Use of diuretics should be terminated a few days prior to surgery unless the patient has been in heart failure. If the patient is receiving digitalis and diuretics, hypokalemia and marked potentiation of the digitalis effect is a danger, so a potassium supplement should be given. Fluid balance is then regulated according to the state of hydration of the patient at surgery. Corticosteroids should be given for premedication in patients who are receiving them for treatment or have received them for a prolonged period during the preceding one to two years. Hydrocortisone or a similar preparation is given the day before, just prior to anesthesia, and in tapering doses for two to three days afterwards. In doubtful cases, the cortisin test may be done. If plasma cortisol levels do not rise adequately, corticosteroid administration is definitely indicated. What about specific disease problems? The hyperthyroid and hypothyroid patient with an altered basal metabolic rate requires and tolerates changes in the doses of premedication roughly in proportion to changes in the level of metabolism. Diabetic patients, if well controlled, generally tolerate belladonna, narcotics, barbiturate and non-barbiturate sedatives well. Phenothiazine and butyrophenone derivatives usually cause some elevation of the blood sugar, but these drugs are well tolerated if there are specific psychic indications for their use. If not well controlled, acid-based disturbances and ketonuria should be treated with glucose and insulin before pre-medication. In emergency surgery, in the face of poor control, pre-medication should be omitted or given in reduced dosage. What about metabolic and neuromuscular diseases, doctor? Since virtually all sedatives are metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidneys, these drugs should be used only if there are overriding reasons to relieve pain or assuage agitation, but the dose should be reduced in relation to the severity and site of the organ disease. Porphyria is considered an absolute contraindication to the use of barbiturates because muscular paralysis may occur. Patients with Addison's disease and with myxedema are usually very weak and poorly tolerate all sedative drugs. So premedicants should be used only when clearly indicated and then only in very small doses. Patients with neuromuscular disorders, such as myasthenia gravis, muscular dystrophy, and dystrophia myotonia, should not receive barbiturates or any other sedative drugs that depress respiration or may reduce skeletal muscle tone. What about inborn errors of drug metabolism? The term Idiosyncrasy to drugs has long been used in pharmacology and anesthesiology to describe the peculiar drug reactions that occur in certain individuals. It may appear as extreme sensitivity 
to small doses with effects of the kind that usually occur at much higher doses or decreased responsiveness or greatly prolonged action. The reactions also may be of a kind not ordinarily seen at any dose, such as severe hyperthermia. The classification of untoward drug reaction as idiosyncratic is likely to be rather uncertain as long as the mechanism remains obscure. However, recent advances in pharmacogenetics have exposed the precise mechanism of some idiosyncratic responses and promises to clarify others. Idiosyncrasy may now be defined more precisely as a genetically determined abnormal response to a drug. To understand this fully requires elucidation of the mechanism whereby the usual drug effect is altered in the genetically abnormal person. Of the biochemical abnormality that constitutes the phenotypic expression of the genetic defect and also of the pattern of inheritance of the genotype. With regard to drugs used in premedication, only a few idiosyncrasies have been described. Barbiturates cause an abnormal inductibility of lambda aminolevulinic acid synthetase in hepatic porphyria. The mode of hereditary transmission being autosomal dominant. Atropine response may be greatly decreased due to the presence of atropine esterase seen in rabbits. And several psychotropic drugs, for example caffeine, are prone to cause habituation and abuse on a genetic basis not yet defined. Genetic hemoglobin abnormalities and glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase appear to be without adverse effect until the blood is challenged with certain drugs, but premedicant drugs have not yet been implicated. What about drug allergies, doctor? Allergy to drugs is uncommon with the drugs ordinarily employed for premedication, although patients sometimes state they are allergic to barbiturates and some of the narcotic analgesics. These patients should be sedated with antihistaminics such as diphenhydramine or promethazine, even if they are uncertain about their state of allergy. Do hepatic or renal diseases influence the choice of premedication? Hepatic disease is a relative contraindication to virtually all drugs used in anesthesiology. Unless the patient is in hepatic coma, there are no specific absolute contraindications to the use of sedative drugs. In the presence of jaundice, it is better judgment to avoid those sedatives that are known to cause the condition, for example, chlorpromazine. But even with these drugs, a single administration is of remote significance to the patient's disease. Renal disease is a potentially serious problem in relation to drug therapy because many drugs depend on the kidney for their normal elimination. One-time administration of sedative type drugs is usually of no concern unless the patient is in uremia or anuric, in which case hypnotic drugs should be avoided or given only in very small dosage. Dr. Dobkin, what special considerations are posed by chronic alcoholism? 
As long as the patient is receiving enough alcohol to maintain mental composure, premedican drugs are well tolerated, although resistance to average dosage is claimed. If the patient is receiving disulfram, its combination with barbiturates causes severe depression. The chronic alcoholic who is in a withdrawal state is prone to cardiorespiratory collapse if given a sedative. Instead, he should be given a dilute infusion of alcohol prior to induction of anesthesia. The patient in acute alcoholism usually tolerates tranquilizers quite well, but depressant drugs should be given intravenously, slowly and in dilute form, so that the danger of collapse is avoided. What other drugs make incompatible combinations? Patients under treatment for depression, especially with monoamine oxidase inhibitors, are sensitive to narcotic analgesics, particularly meperidine. Patients receiving antihypertensive drugs, with or without diuretics, should not be given potent sedative drugs because severe hypotension may occur suddenly. What about the mentally disturbed patient? Mentally agitated patients usually tolerate very much greater than normal doses of the premedicant drugs used for sedation. Hypoxia or use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors should always be ruled out as the cause of the agitation. Seriously depressed patients should not receive depressant sedative drugs before anesthesia. They are extremely sensitive mentally and physiologically to the phenothiazines, butyrophenones, and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, all of which may induce an attempt at suicide. Are there any drug restrictions for the mentally retarded? As long as the mentally retarded patient has no serious physical or physiological debility, premedication is well tolerated. When intelligence is very low, these patients are sometimes difficult to manage during preparation for induction, so it is useful to sedate them heavily unless specific contraindications exist. Since many such patients have convulsions and are receiving anticonvulsant therapy, they are quite tolerant of barbiturates which may be freely used in their premedication. What about patients with cardiac or pulmonary disease? Patients with severe myocardial disease or pulmonary insufficiency are usually intolerant of narcotic analgesics. However, when a major corrective operation is planned, close supervision and judicious use of these drugs especially morphine, ensures a more relaxed patient and an easier induction of anesthesia than if no sedation is given. These patients should be given every consideration, not only for physical comfort, but for psychic relaxation as well. This is now possible with several tranquilizers such as diazepam and hydroxyzine that have little or no appreciable effect on respiration or circulation. What about special situations? Uh, for example, within the recovery room and in hospitals without recovery rooms. The usual practice in recovery rooms is to check every patient who is restless or appears to have discomfort to make sure that vital signs are stable, adequate pulmonary ventilation, absence of bleeding, stable near normal blood pressure, and so on, and that hypoxia is not a factor. 
Patients should then be checked for full bladder and positional discomfort. If the complaint is then obviously due to pain, a small dose of a narcotic analgesic, such as 10 milligrams of alpha protein, may be given slowly in dilute form intravenously. If the patient is cold or shivering and warming blankets do not help promptly, a small dose, 5 milligrams, of chlorpromazine may be given intravenously. Where there are no recovery rooms, depressant drugs should be omitted or given in relatively small doses preoperatively so that the effect is dissipated by the end of the operation. Dr. Dobkin, does the question of outpatients deserve special consideration? Outpatients should not receive any sedative drugs unless the patient is accompanied by an adult who can properly take care of him and space is provided for the patient to lie down afterward if necessary. In general, potent drugs that may depress respiration, blood pressure, or the cough reflex should not be used. Mild tranquilizers and small doses of hypnotic sedatives are usually well tolerated in the healthy subject. What about the use of premedication in life-saving emergencies? There is little or no place for premedication in these patients if the airway, oxygen supply, and cardiovascular systems are not under full control. If they're not, premedication may only be useful to control the patient who is manic or extremely restless, in which case the patient is managed in the same way as one recovering from anesthesia. Doctor, what should be said about the use of premedicants in pregnant women for both obstetrical and non-obstetrical procedures? In early pregnancy, the first trimester, no potent drugs should be used unless there are overriding therapeutic reasons, such as severe pain or acute agitation. But mild hypnotic sedatives may be used in usual doses. In late pregnancy, after the seventh month, the general rules apply, but it is wise to err on the low dose side, basing dosage on the patient's weight when she was not pregnant. Premedican drugs are well tolerated during labor by the healthy mother. Analgesics and hypnotics should be given in modest doses and avoided if delivery is expected within four hours. Tranquilizers in moderate doses combined with scopolamine are usually well tolerated by both mother and child. If the mother or fetus is in difficulty, depressant drugs are best avoided and intermittent inhalation analgesics such as trichloroethylene or methoxyfluorine or regional block anesthesia should be used exclusively. Dr. Dobkin, would you summarize your approach to the patient who is to receive preoperative medication? Preoperative medication should be initiated as soon as the patient is in hospital and aware of impending surgery. And it should start with psychologic support by all staff. The patient must be assured by word and deed that everyone with whom he has contact knows what to do to save him unnecessary pain and discomfiture and will do the proper things at the appropriate time. Equanimity can be encouraged by carefully explaining the procedures that will be followed, but the specific side effects of anesthesia and surgery should not be dwelt on unless the patient inquires about them. It is also wise not to dismiss the discomforts of operation with sweeping statements that belittle the intelligence of any reasonably informed patient. 
and that may provoke mistrust and anxiety. The anesthesiologist, who should see the patient as soon as surgery is scheduled, must determine what drugs the patient has been taking, whether he has drug allergies, what his past experience with anesthetics and pre-anesthetic drugs has been, whether the patient prefers or has a particular antipathy to any specific agent or technique, for instance, needles, ether, or masks. In the operating theater, the anesthesiologist should again assure the patient that he will be in attendance throughout the procedure and during much of the recovery period and will make certain that pain and dysfunction will be minimal. He should explain each procedure, the use of cuffs, needles, monitor leads, until the patient is fully asleep or regionally anesthetized. Surgeons must not examine the patient while preparations for anesthesia are in progress. Most of the agents and procedures we have been discussing here are designed to help the anesthesiologist provide psychic sedation, analgesia, and amnesia, and block, in addition to pain and unpleasant memories, such untoward cholinergic reflexes as excessive bradycardia, salivation, nausea, and headache. The psychosedatives are indicated only when there is great anxiety, as before life-threatening procedures or psychotic behavior. The neurosedatives or narcotics are sufficient for the usual mild anxiety. Thank you very much, Dr. Dobkin, for an interesting, comprehensive discussion. Anesthesia Rounds is presented as a service to clinicians in the field of anesthesiology by Aerst Laboratories.